Good morning. My name is Dustin Cole, and I'm a PhD student at Michigan State University, going into both my fifth year in the program and the job market this coming fall. And this morning, I'd like to talk with you about how organizations can be agents of equity and inclusion within the communities in which they operate. And my dissertation has really focused in on how organizations can operate more beneficially in the communities in which they're located. Now, before I get into the presentation itself, I just wanted to give a little bit of a heads up. First, this might not be the traditional type of presentation you would see at an INFORMS talk. It's purely empirical with heavy qualitative elements within the presentation itself. And second, perhaps the most defining part of my life right now is I have three small children. So there's lots of arts and craft time. And for me, part of that has been making presentations that are a little bit more colorful, which my students do appreciate when I teach. They've specifically brought that up. Now, I might come at this at a little bit of a different angle than the rest of the audience that's here today. Uh, originally coming out of my undergraduate degree, I was a social worker. So I spent several years working with individuals one-on-one -on -one to try and find ways to better integrate them within the work environment. But I eventually ended up going back and getting an MBA degree and I had the opportunity to work in the sourcing department of a large automotive supplier that had several customers that were really interested in sustainability as a topic, uh, primarily Honda and Harley Davidson. And in that position, I helped those organizations to propagate sustainability through the supply chain, through the suppliers that I was working with. Um, and then now in my time at Michigan State University, I might not be working with one company trying to propagate sustainability through its supply chain, but I have the opportunity to work with multiple organizations to try and find ways to help them operate more beneficially within the communities in which they operate. And I think this is important because businesses have the opportunity to be superheroes in the area of equity and inclusion. They are employers. They are such a big part of our life and they have such an influence over society that businesses really have the opportunity to operate in a way that can benefit society. And it's important that they do so because organizations rely on society for everything that they need to operate. It's in the best interest of private businesses to operate in a way that more beneficially helps society. It's, it's going to be hard if workers can't afford their products, if society is crumbling due to climate change. These are things that ben businesses can have a big and beneficial impact for society. And in this research, I wanna look at this from two different perspectives, an internal and an external perspective. Internally, organizations are able to help integrate workers with disabilities more beneficially into the work environment uh, through the inclusion of workers with disabilities, a group of workers that are traditionally marginalized in the workforce. Externally, organizations interact with the communities in which they operate on a regular basis, and they have a big impact on the use of resources in those communities. Organizations need to operate in a way that equitably shares those resources with the local community. Now, for workers with disabilities, this is an important topic for businesses because they employ you know, a huge portion of the workforce and workers with disabilities are traditionally underemployed in both developed and developing regions with chronic unemployment for workers with disabilities in the United States. This is such a problem that the United Nations has um, has listed the uh, employment of marginalized workers, workers with disabilities in its sustainable development goals. So it, it is a global priority. Now, there are a couple types of organizations that are already trying to tackle this problem. Uh, on one end of the spectrum are sheltered workshops like the Empowerment Plan out of Detroit, Michigan, where there's a heavy focus on vocational and social supports and workers are able to learn job skills in a 
perhaps more forgiving environment to help them step into the more traditional workforce. On the other end of the spectrum are more traditional publicly traded companies like Walgreens. With its Ready program, Walgreens has a strong focus on employing workers with disabilities in its distribution centers. Now, in the middle between those two types of, those two extremes of the spectrum, are social enterprises. These are organizations that have a heavy emphasis on social and vocational supports, but they also have the same financial considerations of any other private organization. Um, and, and this is just a brief overview. More information on these types of organizations can be found in a book chapter coming up in Responsible Business Operations that I've written with my advisor, Sri Ram Narayanan. Now, in the research that I'm primarily going to go over today, it really looks at how organizations that employ a large number of workers with disabilities can more can improve their productivity um, to 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 better to improve their operational performance, and more specifically, we look at what impact a direct supervisor with personal experience with disability has on the productivity of workers with disabilities. Now, there are a couple of reasons. Now, there are a couple of reasons that organizations may, as part of their corporate strategy, target employing a large number of workers with disabilities. One, there are financial benefits that the organization can receive. An example of this would be the Ability One program through the Department of Defense. And with that program, when an organization employs a certain level of workers with disabilities within the organization, it can get access to special contracts it couldn't access otherwise. There can also be reputational benefits. An organization that is seen as acting socially responsible has, is viewed more beneficially by society. Those same reputational benefits can also happen internally. An organization that is viewed as socially responsible can have a workforce that will work harder for the same amount of money because being in an organization that reflects well upon the worker is a place that those workers want to be. Now, there can be some challenges when an organization employs a large number of workers with disabilities. One of these challenges is related to managing the accommodations. It can be difficult for a supervisor in these types of environments to understand the proper methods to implement and manage those accommodations long term, even if they're aware of the policies of the company that revolve around the implementation of those accommodations, which the manager might not be. There's also variability in the ability of workers with disabilities to perform certain tasks. There are certain tasks that they may not be able to perform that other workers may have an easier time with. Now, these create two specific operational challenges when organizations employ a large number of workers with disabilities. First is compounding complexity. As the number of workers with a disability in the work group increases, so does the potential number of accommodations that are occurring within that work group. This can lead to greater cognitive and time burden on the manager as they need to implement and manage those accommodations. There's also a greater chance of task mismatch as the proportion of the work group that has a disability increases. With each additional worker with a disability in the work group, there's the potential that you might not be able to match that worker with their ideal task. These can create operational challenges for those managers who are supervising the work group. Now, there are a couple of reasons that we believe a supervisor who has personal experience with disability might be able to better manage these challenges. One is supervisory fit. A direct manager is the primary point of communication, contact, training, everything in a worker's day-to-day -day life. A supervisor who has personally overcome those challenges may be better equipped to help other workers navigate the challenges of accommodations and working in the work environment with a disability. There's also the aspect of empathy. A supervisor who, has, who is better able to predict the emotional state of their workers is better able to, is able to achieve better productivity out of those workers. A supervisor who is 
been through those specific challenges related to disability in the workplace, they may better understand the emotional challenges of those workers. And then there's motivation. A supervisor with a disability shows to these workers that they have the ability to work, move up within the organization. And having a sign that you can move up in the organization helps workers to invest their time and efforts back into that organization, understanding that it can be rewarded. Now, based on what I've just gone over, we have one main hypothesis in this research, and that's when there's an increasing number or ratio of workers with a disability in the work group, having a supervisor with personal experience with disability will improve work group productivity relative to when there is not a supervisor with a disability present in the work group. And we're really focusing in on the interaction term here, the presence of a supervisor with personal experience with disability and the increasing ratio or number of workers with a disability in the work group. Now to do this research, um, we were able to get data from, if you're in the Lansing area, it's, the company is called Peckham Industries. If you're not from the Lansing area, um, it's a large social enterprise based in Michigan in the Lansing area. And they have a number of business units within their organization. And specifically, they have a garment manufacturing, well, a pair of them in the Lansing area. And they were willing to share productivity data for those facilities with us to do this analysis. Now, in our analysis, the primary outcome variable of interest is the productivity of those workers. And this is measured by the number of labor hours that are needed to produce a garment. Um, there are other productivity measures in the data which all confirm our results, but this is the primary one we used in our main analysis. And since it's the number of labor hours to produce a garment, um, it's more hours is worse. So a larger coefficient is bad. Um, and then our primary predictor variables of interest are the number or ratio of workers with a disability in the work group, whether a line leader with a disability is in the work group, and the interaction term between those. And we have a number of control variables for time and worker skill and the type of garment that's being produced in there as well. Now, in this type of environment, there are a couple of estimation challenges. One, there are multiple production lines running in the same facility at the same time. So what happens within that facility will impact all of those production lines. This creates contemporaneous correlation between our observations on the same day. There's also going to be a strong correlation between the productivity today and the productivity of the prior day. A work group working on the same garment will likely have this relatively the same productivity moving day to day. Now to help get around these estimation challenges, we use a Price-Weinstein regression, which is able to account for both of these things while also being robust to heteroscedasticity. Now, I, I just wanna pause on this slide for a moment because this is our main results. The marginal plots I'm gonna show next tell the story much, much better than this table does. But what we end up seeing highlighted here is that as the number or ratio of workers with a disability in the work group increases, when there is a supervisor with a disability in the work group, the productivity of that work group does improve with the number of labor hours needed to produce a car garment uh, dropping. Now, here are the marginal plots I referred to, and, and these really tell the story of what's going on here. The blue line represent work groups where there is a supervisor with a disability present in the work group, and the orange line represents work groups where there is not a supervisor with a disability present in the work group. And what we end up seeing is this improvement to productivity it's not due to a direct improvement to the worker's productivity, but rather it's a mitigation of the potential productivity decline as the number or ratio of workers with a disability in the work group increases. As these challenges build up, as there's additional accommodations, as there's greater potential for task mismatch, a supervisor who has personal experience with the disability, they're better able to manage these challenges and not let productivity be affected. Now, these results are robust to many estimation methods, um, and we use different DVs for them. But what this doesn't do is necessarily explain all of the mechanisms underlying what's going on. So to supplement the quantitative study, we did a qualitative study 
interviewing individuals from other organizations that employ a large number of workers with disabilities. Now, we developed a standardized questionnaire for this, which was translated in a couple of languages to account for uh, different languages being spoken at the different work sites that we were doing the interviews at. And we did the interviews over the course of about six months between December and May, December of last year and May of this year. Um, and we chose to do this at two different organizations from the organization that um, did our provided the data for the quantitative analysis for two reasons. One, it helps to showcase the generalizability of this research. Here in this research alone, we have three large organizations that specifically employ a large number of workers with disabilities as part of their corporate strategy. One of the interview organizations is another social enterprise, and one of them is a large publicly traded company. Now, at each of these organizations, we interviewed 20 individuals, 10 workers and 10 supervisors five of each group having a disability of some form and five not having any kind of disability. Now, the results of our case study, which can be seen more fully in the paper, which is currently going through a revision process for resubmission, the results really boil down to three major points. Um, and these really center around stability. Workers with a disability had a strong preference for stability in their work environment. They became very anxious when there was change, whether that's individuals or change in the task that is occurring. Now, the workers with a disability, they really focused in on communicating with individuals who they were already familiar with. They didn't prefer it when, that, when new individuals were coming in and they had to have that change in relationship. They were still wanting to talk to their old supervisors. For the supervisors with a disability, they really focused in on the interpersonal relationship and connecting with those workers daily, which the supervisors without a disability focused in on that as well, but they also were more they were also more rapid to use outside agents, not, not outside the organization, but different departments within the same organization, bringing in new people into the work group when there were challenges, which is something that the workers with disabilities weren't necessarily particularly comfortable with. The bigger stability issue though, was a preference for task stability. And this is due to having greater challenges when learning how to perform the tasks. Now, this can be due to cognitive challenges, but also try to think about learning how to do something without the use of your eyesight. It's difficult. The workers with a disability needed more time to learn tasks. So moving around within the work environment, it created challenges for those workers and some workers went as far as to say when they were moving between jobs or departments, they became physically ill because they were so anxious about not being able to do a good job. Now, the supervisors without a disability, they focused in on cross-training and flexibility as focuses within the work group. And there are a lot of operational benefits to cross-training and flexibility within the work environment. However, for the supervisors without a disability, they were really focused in on, well, I retrain the worker, I keep the worker in their place. One went as far as to say, if a worker is struggling, they don't get moved. They just stay in that job and they don't change to another job. So this preference of the supervisors with a disability to keep workers in the same task, to not move them around, this seems to give a reason as to why there's this mitigation of the potential productivity declines. They're able, they're, they're operating in a way that better suits the learning needs of those workers with a disability. And while cross training and flexibility are very important in a traditional work environment for operational benefits, in this type of work environment, it seems like stability and avoiding more of the cross training and flexibility, that actually has greater uh, operational benefits than the productivity and the cross training do. Now, so far in the, I've just talked about kind of what organizations can do to better include marginalized workers and how they can be more inclusive. And I just wanna take a few minutes to talk about how organizations and supply chains can interact with the external community to more equitably use the resources that are within that community. And specifically, I wanna talk about water. 
water is critical for everyone's survival. It's, it's critical for, you know, just basic human survival, but everything organizations do and sell that requires water as well, even in an indirect manner. And there are a few reasons that water is a critical resource within the community, both for organizations and the community itself. One, water is regionally bound and the pollutants that are in the water in that area stay in that water. As the water is used up in that area, the water doesn't necessarily flow from a different region. Think about Michigan. There's the Great Lakes. It's very humid. There's a lot of swampland in the area. There are a lot of water resources. Compare that to California. There are not nearly as many water resources and they're much more strained. Now, a lack of water resources can have health impacts for the community. This, uh, can, lead, this can be due both to disease, but also you can't have as good a sanitation without proper water resources in the region. And water is also at the center of the food energy water nexus. Water is needed for basic survival, but it's also needed for growing food and for energy production. An example of this is recently due to the droughts in California, a hydroelectric plant had to be shut down. Without necessary water resources, energy can't be produced. Now, water has economic and non-economic value within the community. The economic value comes from the normal business uses to produce products and sell them, which bring income into the region. But at odds with that are the non-economic uses of water that are of value to the local community green spaces, swimming areas, you know, the ability to have a nice, nice drinking water. These are all things that can be at odds with what organizations want to do with water, which makes this a sustainability topic that really connects environmental and social sustainability together. The organization and the community need to work together to help improve um, this environmental concern for both the community and the organization's sake. And one additional piece of research we did was looking at our organizations that are traditional paragons of environmental sustainability, are they responding to water stress at the local level? As water stress increases, are organizations reducing their water pollutants to help preserve the quality of that local water? And what we ended up finding is they're not organizations aren't necessarily responding to a lack of water resources in a local region. And this shows that maybe how sustainability is being communicated to businesses needs to be altered in a way to help make it more inclusive of multiple environmental challenges. Now, water is becoming more prominent as an environmental sustainability concern, but there's still a long way to go. Now, in this talk, there are three really major talking points that I want you to walk away with. Um, one is that workers with a disability, they really prefer a stable task environment, which can be at odds with the more traditional focus on cross-training and flexibility within the work environment. Second, this stability can help be brought about through upward mobility programs the supervisors who have a disability run their work groups in a way that seems more conducive to, um, to the workers with a disability. And this showcases how diversity higher up in the organization can help diversity lower in the organization. A management team that has people who represent the full workforce it can better understand the challenges of those workers. And this is important because of the vast number of workers with disabilities who are unemployed and the underemployment of that group in society. This is a way in which organizations can help to integrate those workers better, which is also important to organizations in the current tight labor market. Now, Externally, organizations can also, also need to focus in on their water use and how they can better use local community resources in a way that helps preserve them for the local community's use. And now just to finish up, I, I want to tie this back to the quote I showed at the beginning of this presentation. Organizations can have a dramatic impact on the local communities in which they're operating. And it's in the best interest of those organizations to have a beneficial impact. If organizations operate in a way in which they make society better, then they'll be more welcomed within society and they'll have a better reputation. 
for the long-term sustainability of organizations, they really need to be taking these things into consideration. Um, so here would be a good time for any questions that anyone might have. Um, I'll check the chat as well. Oh, and that was a link for the INFORMS uh, webinar series. Um, are, are there any questions or clarifications I can provide to anyone at this time? Dustin, thank you so much for your talk. I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, the slides were very beautiful. Uh, I love the colors and the information <laughs> you provided. So it was very entertaining. So let's see if someone um, has a question. If you want, you can put it in the chat or you can ask, unmute yourself and ask the question. Let's keep one, a couple of seconds uh, or I do have a couple of questions to, to ask you. Dustin, do you have any information on what type of disabilities or the sort of variants and disabilities that we're seeing among these employees? I imagine there's a big difference between physical and cognitive and other mental disabilities. So some very basic information on that. Um, due to HIPAA concerns, we couldn't get down into like real details on what disabilities they have. But while yes, physical and mental or cognitive disabilities, th they do manifest in different ways in the workspace they both benefit from stability in the task environment. So the workers who have physical challenges, learning to how to overcome those physical challenges and really use their accommodations, that can take time and they, they really appreciate having that time and do better when they have that time. But for the workers with mental or cognitive disabilities, there's, there's anxiety and stress to take into consideration. So being moved around in the work environment can stress those workers. Um, so while, you know, workers with physical disabilities, it's about, you know, pokey oaks and things to accommodate um, the workers, it's, it's a lot of it is about, you know, they need to have a stable work environment where they can learn and the workers with mental and cognitive disabilities, it's, it's, it's similar. Yes, their accommodations are more about flexibility and being able to have a work schedule that's more accommodating to their mental needs, but that stability also plays an important benefit for them as well. Great, thanks. Absolutely. So I have a I have a question. Uh, so, oh wait, my microphone is gone. So, um, uh, oh, uh, Michael, I think you have yes. a question. Yes, Michael, you can you can ask your question. Sure, thank you, uh, Dustin. Can you hear me? Okay, I can. Wonderful. Um, Thanks for your presentation. I enjoyed it very much. Um, given, you know, the very broad and deep literature in operations management, um, what advice would you give to those who um, are primarily engaged with, uh, you know, quantitative models for um, production optimization who have not considered any of these issues of disability or sustainability um, before? Yeah, so there is um, a little bit of research that's starting to kind of move in that direction. Um, you know, it, it's a tough question um, and I don't have a perfect answer for you, but I, I do think that perhaps a little bit of different models are needed for workers with disabilities. Um, well, there are a lot of similarities with the general workforce. I mean, they're, they're workers just like everyone else. There are unique challenges, but I also think that they're challenges that can help understand other populations as well. So aging workers, uh, the workforce is just getting older. Like it's just, it just is because, um, you know, slower population, slower birth rate and stuff. Like BMW has a factory that's specifically being built around um, an aging workforce. And a lot of the challenges that were being overcome to make it more accommodating for workers with disabilities were also making it more accommodating for workers who were older. Um, during the interviews, this is the thing that stuck with me the most. One manager called his workplace White Glove City. And he was describing it like that because he said, because of the accommodations and things they had done to make the work 
less physical. It also meant they had a lot more aging workers in the workforce. And as he called them, they had a lot of grandmothers there. So he had to be very careful about how he talked. He's like, you can't swear, you can't yell. Like you have all of these grandmothers as he referred to them in the workplace. So it, it showcases how this can be expanded to other groups as well. This, this inclusion of workers with disabilities, it, it helps spread inclusion to other workers as well. So some literature that might be out there on workers who are aging would be beneficial, but it, it, it's also generalizable to other work groups as well. So even you know, doing some modeling specifically about workers with disabilities, it's, it's really easy to translate that into, well, this is workers with disabilities and aging workers. So suddenly we're going from like, 6% of the workforce to 30% of the workforce. And like, it, it expands really quickly to say like, this isn't necessarily something that's super unique. It's widespread. It just hasn't necessarily been addressed nearly as well, which I realize that isn't a great answer to what you're asking, but I, I do think it's something that can really be looked at from a couple of different angles. Great, thank you. Absolutely. Um, Sri Ram, I think you had a question. You know, I, I was I was going to add to your comments, Dustin. I think I think Michael, one of the things one I, I, I'm just thinking aloud um, uh, as partner in Dustin's research. Uh, I just think that uh, you know there are there are issues within within a broader modeling framework where one can think of how you can design teams that are going to be more inclusive while you consider different aspects of people's strengths. So for example, uh, traditional assembly line problems, uh, typically for us are very people neutral. You know, We don't really care about how people are embedded in those assembly line problems. Or sometimes we may, we may think that uh, when you put a configuration of a group together, uh, the flow is going to be constant and it may not be constant, uh, particularly with respect to you know, like how, 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 if you're giving specific accommodations to people that Dustin was describing before, uh, those are, I think, opportunities to design teams and structures around them, um, and perhaps, and and you know, the big bottleneck is really uh, granular data. So not many people are able to collect the kind of micro data. So we are hoping that you know, uh, maybe as you as we sort of work with smaller groups, collect more micro data. The 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 secondary part to me is also some of this is very context specific. Um, you know, you look at the rehabilitation literature, um, it's mostly qualitative, um, and I think uh, Dustin did cite many of them, um, and, and um, uh, that's where perhaps more ideas around how to model them would be very um, uh, useful. I, I don't know if that helps at all, but just, just a couple of cents there. Yeah, thank you. So Caroline, I think you had a couple of questions I'd be happy to talk about. Yeah, so let me, I check if someone else raised their hand because I didn't oh. realize I need to check that part. So let's see if, oh, I see that Roy, he has a question. So if you can go, you can, you can go ahead. And Carolina, you go ahead. I, okay. I okay, so I'll, I'll ask my question. So representation is, is important for sure. And, and, and you have talked that uh, when individuals with disability have to move through positions across the same organization, for example, they can, um, they can go through some anxiety. So what do you think, or have you seen any, uh, what are uh, organizations doing to uh, support these individuals so they can grow in their careers and advance within the industry? Or if they are not doing anything about that, what do you think we are missing to, to help these individuals succeed in, in their workplace? Yeah, so I, I think there are two major things I would point out, and these are referring back to the organizations we've worked with, so they're, they're really exemplars in this space. Um, one is providing the infrastructure in place for these workers, so I'm not necessarily saying like capital investments and stuff like that, um, but like having access to social services and vocational services, just people who can help these workers and understand them more. Um, like the, the publicly traded company, they don't have an internal vocational services department, but they can contract out with someone outside. Um, but also even more simply within their work environment, people who've experienced those challenges, they can help other individuals who are experiencing those challenges. Um, 
you know, a, a someone who has gone through it, who has really experienced that, like they understand what's going on. We had one executive um, at one of the companies talk, we were talking to them, going over our results, making sure everything made sense. And we were talking to her and she'd been there for 30 years. And this is a social enterprise that's its mission is employment of workers with disabilities. Like that is what they do. And she was talking about how she was talking to this worker who had a disability and she was trying to figure out why this worker was having challenges with her productivity. She just couldn't make right. And then the worker's like, well, I, you know, and she listed what she disability she had. I, I, you know, I blank and it makes it really hard. And the executive said, I hadn't even thought about that. Like we all have our own experiences and we all go through the workplace with those experiences. So just having someone in place who understands that can help those workers. You know, the, the managers we spoke to, the ones who didn't have a disability, a lot of them said, I, I had never worked with someone who had a disability before. Like, I just didn't understand what's going on. And they would talk about, yeah, we, we have some managers. We have this one manager. He had a leg replacement. And workers just, they were more open about talking about their mobility challenges because this guy, he'd been through it. He was more familiar with it. It, it created openness. And I also think the other piece of advice for organizations is just, don't make it about workers with and without disabilities. It's not a us and them and how do we integrate them. It's a how do we make the work environment more amenable to everyone? Because a lot of the things that are done to make the work environment easier for workers with disabilities, they just make the work environment easier for everyone. Um, an example of this would be organizational bins. Um, workers who can't, who are blind, they can't see what's in the bin, so they need to be able to feel and see what's in them just by feel. Those same kind of bins, they can help the efficiency of all kinds of workers. So when a work environment, if, if you're focusing on, well, what can we do to specifically integrate these workers? Well, we need to do this and this, and it becomes this list of tasks. But then if it turns into, well, we're going to have a you know Six Sigma meeting, and we're like, what can we do to make work easier for everyone? Here's some stuff we're doing for these people. Here's some stuff we're doing for these workers who are blind. Like it just, it makes it about well, what can we do to make life easier for everyone? And I, I think that really helps with the mindset and having that culture of we just need to include everyone. It, it, it's us, not us and them. So that's, those are two things that I think organizations could do without having to spend a lot of money. Thank you. That's very insightful. Well, thank you. So uh, Dustin, what yeah. I was thinking about is I was just building on what Michael asked regarding mathematical modeling. And I'm just curious to know what are the opportunities and challenges that you have encountered in publishing this body of work in peer review journals? What advice do you have for us? Um, I mean, in terms of challenges, it's, it's a little bit of a niche area and it does draw on a lot of rehabilitation facilitation literature. Um, there aren't a lot of, there aren't a lot of operational, there isn't a lot of operational research specifically addressing this and what there is tends to be older. Um, so it can be a little bit challenging in that, I, it seems like it would be beneficial in that, hey, this is a new and novel area and we can have these direct impacts. And hey, if you do this, like a leader with a disability in the work group, at this ratio of workers with disability, hey, you can improve productivity 3%. Like that is a substantial amount of productivity improvement for if you have your workforce has some kind of disability. Um, but there are the challenges related to it's a new and novel area, but also just getting the proper data. So unlike most workplaces, there are a lot of HIPAA considerations related to this. Um, so it can be a little more challenging to get um, personalized data. Um, and there are some organizations who are a little more willing to talk than others, but those are definitely two of the big challenges. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. Um, Jennifer, I think you had a question. Yeah, thanks so much for your talk. I really appreciated your graphic novel style slides. That was fun. Um, thank you. So you mentioned at the beginning that like there's some different reasons that companies will invest in um, workers with different abilities. Um, is productivity always the goal with looking at, you know, these accommodations and things, or are there other objectives that you would consider for um, making changes to the workplace, things like that? Well, so for like, there are some organizations where their mission is just, we want to help 
we want to help integrate these marginalized workers. Like productivity is not their concern. Like the empowerment plan out of Detroit, like their goal is not productivity. Their goal is we want to help workers get into the normal workforce. So there are goals beyond that. Um, and I think while, while concentrating on improving productivity while they're there is important, a lot of the organizations that are focusing on this, it's it's a mission. Like they, they view this as something that's important for society. And this is starting to spread outside of traditional sheltered workshops and social enterprises to other organizations that are really trying to focus on inclusion and equity within the workplace. Um, so like another example of this, and this is not an organization we've ever spoken to, like Microsoft, they do a lot of tracking of inclusivity within their organization. And it's not necessarily related to workers with disabilities, but I, I do think more organizations are starting to see, well, we, we need to be beneficial partners with the communities in which we operate. Otherwise, it's, it's going to be a little more challenging. So it's, yes, there's productivity concerns, but I think there's also just a, a social mission, a social responsibility mission that comes in. Great, thanks. Thank you. So anyone has any further questions? I don't see any hands up. I hope I'm not missing anyone. I don't see anyone myself either. Okay, so, but before uh, I thank you, uh, let me I put up a slide uh, so everyone can see, I hope you can see this just like yes. the presentation for next week. So with this, I want to thank you, Dustin, with, for your time uh, and your research. Uh, I really enjoyed this uh, hour we had talking with you and uh, all the les lessons learned from your work. Uh, I also want to invite everyone for next week. Uh, in two weeks, we have uh, Jennifer Lowell from University of Virginia. She's going to be with us and she actually participated in today's uh, webinar series. So thank you, uh, Dr. Jennifer Lowell, for being with us today as well. So she's going to be talking about detecting, understanding, and reducing diabetes belt preventive care disparities. Uh, remember to register. The information, uh, it is on the Inform CI uh, website. And then uh, you can also watch all of the webinar series that uh, have been recorded and are gonna be posted there. Thank you so much everyone for your time. Uh, stay safe and healthy and hope to see you in two weeks. Thank you so much, Dustin, for all of your time. Well, thank you for the opportunity. This has been wonderful. Thank you everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>